Hello and welcome to this IBE webinar. Uh, what are the hot ethical topics that ethics and compliance practitioners need to know? Um, my name's Catherine Bradshaw and I'm here with uh, Simon Webley, who's our research director here at the IBE. Hello. And Lynn Byberg, who's our researcher. And um, I'm delighted that they're going to be here to um, answer all our questions um, about what um, these hot topics might be. Now, we're basing this webinar on two um, briefings which we've published, uh, one about the ethical lapses of last year and another one about the surveys, which, um, which also appeared last year and um, early this year, which um, provide the context for some of these hot topics. Uh, we've put these in our um, um, in the handout section, which is on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, there's also a chat function there. And if you're having a technical problem, please um, pop your question in there and one of the events team will help you out. Um, I'd also welcome anyone if you want to pop something in the chat, like who you are, where you're from, and please feel free to do so and interact with other participants. Uh, we'll also be having um, questions later, so um, do start thinking about any questions you might have and you can pop them in the questions um, tab as well. Now, um, if we don't get through any of your questions, um, don't worry, um, because we've only got half an hour for this webinar. We'll get back to you later via email um, if we can help you. So um, about these briefings, Simon, I wonder if you could um, talk us through and um, why we do these um, annual briefings. Yes, uh, we think it's very important at the Institute of Business Ethics to keep up to date with not just what we think and we see and we read, but what others do as well. <clears throat> so we um, monitor every uh, week what the media uh, are saying about um, uh, events or something that's happening uh, which is about ethics, uh, usually at the workplace, and Lynn looks after that. Uh, and at the, um, the same time, we uh, also look and see what people are surveying, um, not just ourselves, about the way in which values are applied in, in the, at the workplace, whatever that workplace is. And uh, we have got nine of these uh, last year, and we've uh, published what uh, a summary of those surveys. And we take all that data and we then try and see what the trends are about both the issues and the concerns uh, of, of people about applying the values to uh, everyday business life. And so we thought we'd ask you, actually, our participants, what you think the hot ethical topics um, are for you in, in the work that you do. And we've got a poll coming up. Um, which I think Alex is going to do. The poll's now open, um, and um, if you'd like to uh, vote on which which of these issues you think is, is kind of most um, hot for you at the moment. So it's quite interesting. I can see you're all starting to vote now, and data protection looks um, very, very, um, very very hot this one and um, so get your um, votes in now um speaking up about wrongdoing which is, is quite good because we're going to be talking about that in a moment um and and corporate tax avoidance work home balance so all of these issues and of course we couldn't put all of the hot topics we wanted to put on there so if you have anything specific that you're dealing with that isn't on there please pop that in the chat as well and and see what um and and also we all ask a question and we'll see what what um what we can suggest about that. Now I'm going to um, collect all those responses now, we'll close the poll and it's quite interesting or very interesting that for you um, speaking, employees being able to speak up about wrongdoing is um, a, you know nearly half of you think that's one of the most hot topics that you're dealing with at the moment. And actually, that's something that we're focusing on a lot um, at the IBU. We've got a good practice guide about it. Um, and, and our Ethics at Work survey showed that one in two employees witness misconduct, but only half of those that do speak up about it. Don't they, Simon? Yes, it's one of the more worrying aspects of, of applied um, business ethics is that, you know, the half of people see things that worry them. Uh, they may talk to a colleague about it and, and discuss it, but do they report it up through the system that uh, so that the higher levels can deal with it? They're very reluctant to do so. 
Uh, there are various reasons for that. Um, Lynn probably, who has yeah, some research have, on this, knows about this. Yeah, I could I could mention those reasons. The, the top three reasons that usually are given is that they feel it might jeopardize their job, mm -hmm. or they felt that something no corrective action would be taken, yeah. or also that it might alienate them from their colleagues, which is quite quite upsetting to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so there's several reasons why people wouldn't report when they mm -hmm. should. And in the surveys um, briefing, um, Lynn, you mentioned um, a survey by a hotline provider uh, called ExpoLink, which indicates that people are are actually more readily um, are speaking up more readily. And this reflects our own findings a little bit. What do you attribute that to? Uh, well, I think one of the things that uh, ExpoLink's uh, whistleblowing report actually talks about is that um while still a lot of organizations use report volume as their success indicator which is just how many reports they got some have started using more outcome based measures mm -hmm. which is quite good sort of uh, checking the number of substantiated reports or the corrective actions taken and i think uh, employees um, might actually think of that as a good step forward and might actually want to speak up more. Uh, and they also found that HR related reports uh, into bullying har and harassment have gone up quite significantly in the last year. Uh, and that might be related to sort of movements such as the Me Too movement. Um, so seeing things pop up in social media on the news might be something that employees value and then they might be able to speak up more readily as well. Mm. And of course, the big news, um, at least from an IBE perspective, is the increased trust in companies, um, um, both from um, the Edelman's survey and the IBE's own survey. And we think potentially this could be thanks to this increase in speaking up. Um, are we also seeing greater transparency from the business sector, Simon? Well, I think there's a general drift to saying that it's we're much more open, thanks largely to social media and other things, about what, what is actually going on and more boards are having the um, this sort of this matter on their agendas uh, because so they can monitor what their own staff is thinking about which can be very difficult if you're spread all over the world but nevertheless uh, and unless they're aware of that things can creep up and suddenly a crisis appears and uh, they're having to, to, to deal with it but um, the, the whole general idea that you you now can speak up about issues that are happening um, is gaining momentum uh, throughout all sizes of organizations. Now we still know that about half of these items are largely HR items. Um, what happens is that they, that, that normally is that the item comes in and there's a triage between the different groups to see who should deal with it. And HR does have to deal with quite a lot of these, but that's right, they, have, they deal with it. And then that, and that's, and then that's good. So with this increase in transparency, but we're still continuing to see un unethical behaviour reported in the press, as our um, lapses briefing captures. So, Lynn, as part of your role at the IBE, you monitor the media for this um, news. How many reports did you collate last year? Uh, well, last year we had 464 different stories. Um, which may not sound like that much, but if you think that we only have 365 days in a year, <laughs> it's quite quite a bit. And, only, and you only work for roughly only, five of those. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, and yeah, we found that the highest number of ethical lapses were in the banking and finance sector and also the IT sector, which is uh, quite surprising. And we also have the professional services sector making um, making the third most um, reported sector. Um, so yeah, there were some interesting findings. Mm. So um, let's talk a, a little bit about the um, technology sector you mentioned. Um, so this is, in, I think it's the most increase in reports of any sector. So are there particular news stories which you think ethics and compliance practitioners can learn from? Um, yeah, I think particularly because data protection and privacy were, was so highly mentioned, it was the third most frequently mentioned issue in general. Um, so I think for ethics and compliance practitioners, definitely data privacy is something to think about. Um, and also AI, because um, you have stories such as about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and also Twitter and hacking of accounts and things like that. Um, so there's definitely some issues included in the technology sector that needs to be looked at. Mm, more widely. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, and you, you mentioned um, in the briefing that there's been a rise in news stories featuring ethical problems in the gig economy. Uh, some 30% of the global working population are employed in this way, 5 million in the UK uh, alone. So why do you think this is of growing importance, Simon? Well, I think that uh, the millennials or the, the, the younger generation, um, A, uh, would like to earn more money. So some of them um, continue to do their day, other job and do their gig on the side. There's, there's an element to that. Others are simply saying, it's more interesting for them to become full-time in the gig economy. They can change, they get more out of it and so on. We're still trying to understand this, the way this thinking works and the implications of that. Uh, but it's, um, it, it's one of the more interesting areas of this last year and I think it will be in this year as well. Mm. You mentioned the positives there, Simon, but were there um, negatives that you picked up, Lynn, in your, in your analysis of the media monitoring? Um, yes, uh, I picked up some negatives in terms of the gig economy itself, so how some companies have um, been reportedly mistreating their workers and not giving them the sort of still some debate about what should be included in a gig economy contract, such as a fair wage or uh, some other benefits like uh, sick pay or holiday pay and things like that. So that was quite um quite frequent in the news um, and also there's uh, from the Deloitte Millennial Survey there's also this thing about uh, millennials not thinking that corporations act ethically so that might also be linked to sort of gig economy work as well. Uh, you mentioned millennials which moves us neatly on um, to um, one, of, one of the surveys that you mentioned in your survey in the survey's briefing. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about why you consider this generation important when it comes to business ethics. Um, so Simon, if you'd like to say a bit, and then Lynn, who's written a blog for us actually, which is on the website today, um, you could um, elaborate. Well, I think the, the, the characteristic of that particular generation is that they send news to themselves and anybody else um, about what's going on, not just uh, at home but in their workplace all the time whereas the older generation didn't uh, did, well uh, they didn't have that facility and they're rather slow to take it up anyway and there's been no, now a number of cases of people uh, emailing about things going on in their organization and even naming names and um, there have been some uh, people who have lost their jobs because of this and that is likely to continue but, so the main thing that, that that has generated is then to, to produce uh, companies to give some guidance about the use of individual social media on a day-to-day -day basis, what they can and cannot say about the company and about the people in the company and so on. But that's only just getting going, as it were. It's 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 a reaction to things, to bad things that have happened. Um, but it's coming, and it's 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 a new item on on the ethics in the ethics agenda these days. How else do you think millennials are are impacting um, the business ethics agenda, Lynn? Uh, well, I think they have sort of I mentioned it in my in my blog as well that they have sort of uh, they focus on different issues or they yeah. put a greater emphasis on different issues than previous generations. So they're quite. Um, influenced sort of by businesses and how they portray themselves to the world so if a business is shown to for example discriminate against certain minorities or uh, is showing a poor report, poor report on sort of uh, human rights and things like that um, then they might sort of avoid those kind of businesses and it's shown also that millennials would rather work for a company that has good ethical standards than prefer a higher pay um, I mean, that's debatable, obviously, um, but um, it's shown that to a greater extent they value ethical behaviour than previous generations and they're quite vocal about that as well. And I suppose as, as we become more um, um, grappling for talent, um, um, that becomes even more important. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, some companies have already, for example, PwC have already sort of put out some standards on how they would approach flexible working and parental leave and things like that to try and catch uh, the greatest talent because they know sort of the upcoming generations care about those kind of policies and, and would like to stay at a company that sort of has uh, some standards and policies in place regarding those. And you mentioned work-home balance. 
and um, um, both with regard to millennials and, and the gig economy. And, and in, our IB, in the IBE's um, public attitude survey, work home balance was highlighted as an issue, uh, which is still in people's minds as something which needs to be addressed. And 10% and of you in this survey today, in this poll today, said the same. Um, and it also comes up in a mental health survey, which um, Lynn, you've cited. Um, yet we're seeing more and more organisations offering flexible working. So do you think it's the always available nature of, of messaging and email that's contributing to this lack of balance, Lynn? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, um, I looked at um, a law that's been, um, been put out in France a couple of years back now, but it actually uh, lets uh, employees not answer emails out of hours, and there's sort of a, a legal obligation not to be available all the time. So I think sort of businesses maybe in the UK and in other places could catch up with things like that, and the sort of constant being available, having your devices with you and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an issue because uh, a lot of um, people specifically in this mental health of work report have said that they feel stressed all the time and they feel like they're never switching off. So it's definitely an issue I think that will be on the agenda for a while. What do you think, Simon? Yes, so I, 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 I agree with that. The, 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 the social media uh, availability has increased the stress in the workplace uh, quite a lot. It, there's a the counter side is that you're also um, learning things where you're at work about things domestically and um and you get diverted very often because of something you you you've read and that wasn't normally done unless there's an absolute crisis in in the past and um organizations are having to come to terms with this type of type of thing now and that's why it, it, it continues to be quite high in the area that the general public or people at work um say that needs addressing by organizations some guidance on this I was reading today of an organisation which is just simply um, not allowing their staff to have their uh, social media on during work time, uh, which is going to be a, interesting to see what happens. Uh, they may lose quite a number of people because they, it, it's become a deep habit. And when that's happened and you try and close it off, you get, get reaction. We'll watch, we'll, watch, we'll watch this area quite, quite closely. Mm. And now before I ask um, our participants for any questions they might have, I've, I've got one final question for you, um, Simon, which is how um, these are the hot topics that, that we've um, seen coming coming to the fore. But how do we deal with these new issues which are coming up all the time? How do you suggest um, we, we start thinking about things which we've never had to think of before, specifically in new technologies? You mean we at the Institute or people in, in the workplace? Well, um, Yes, I say like our ethics and compliance practitioners, how should they start applying things so that they know what to do for a situation they've never had to deal with before? Well, that, ten, that tends to be, it, first of all, they, they notice it and see if it's a one off or three off, but if it's more general, then what you, you get, you get this extended up to the higher levels to, to say we need a policy on this issue. You can draft a possibility, but it needs to be looked at at the highest level and authenticated by them and then put down throughout the organization so people know that there is a, a policy. I think we what we recognize what is 108 different policies um, that, <laughs> that different companies have but it, it, on, on issues not covered by law and regulation. And that's that's the issue. In other words, they, they have the responsibility to issue that guidance themselves. They don't look to the to, to the legal area to, to do it because it isn't necessarily covered by them, although their opinion on these issues has to come in. It, it's a rather new aspect, and the number of the different issues is accelerating in a way, uh, and they're hearing about them and, and what, what to do. And it's been shared about quite a lot too. We, we, they come to us and ask as well. Yeah. So I suppose <laughs> what you're saying is that they um, they need to think how how they, they would apply the corporate ethical values to the problem. Exactly, exactly the, the right point, Catherine. They they take the core values. That's the ethical values, not necessarily uh, the other values, which will also have to be there. And then how do you apply the value of integrity, which is by far the most common value, to this issue? Um, uh, and uh, that takes a bit of doing sometimes, and that's why we get phone calls on this matter. <laughs> yes, on these matters. 
So those are my questions, but I wondered if any of, of, of you listening have got any questions you'd like to put to uh, Lynn and Simon. So you can put that, pop that in your um, in the questions part of the dashboard, which should be on the right hand side of your screen. And we've got a couple coming in here. Um, so somebody says to um, somebody mentions work home balance and thinking about the work home balance and mental health. Does the IB have a briefing or materials available focused on improving well-being at work? Now, I know we've got a few that we're actually currently updating, um, looking at well-being. So what we've been looking at is that diff was different aspects. Um, and as part of our new website, we'll be having a, a section devoted to well-being. But um, do you know of any specific ones that we have that, that we could recommend? No, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't go, go, go straight to that one, but I do know that part of the part of the work on the research hub is having to look at the um, application of the more psychological issue, or, or the, the, getting the psychologists in to help us and others think about these issues from that their professional point of view before you shape a, a policy on them. Um, it, it is it's a matter of some concern to us this and, and we are it is on our agenda yeah and um and we have a, a great question here saying have we seen any good examples of how an organization has communicated its ethics and culture now we do have a um we have a good practice guide um, which has a, quite a few case studies which look at how how people are, communicate um their ethics and values and i'm wondering if our questioner means internally or externally and i guess our perspective here is how you communicate internally what do you think, um, color so? and pictures and um, small groups and um, I mean the one that I find by far the most effective and interesting but it isn't that widely but in a normal team meeting you should give them two or three minutes to a particular scenario if it possible has happened in your organization without the names and get the people in the room to turn to their neighbor and discuss it for two to three minutes and then get on with the meeting. You don't need to go have a wider one and do that regularly. You then raise the basic idea that how you behave and ethics matters and you and you get everybody involved in it. And that technique isn't being widely used, but it's gradually being seen as probably the most effective way to communicate ethical standards in your organization to everybody at different levels. Yes, I heard a great similar example, actually, Simon, which is, um, I think you all are well known, the um, a safety moment, which lots of organisations which have a focus on health and safety yes. do before yes. each meeting. Yes. And they've turned it on its head and call it um, a values moment. And they talk about, they may talk about health and safety as that's one of their values, but they may also talk about other of their values, which I think is a great way of just putting it into everyday life. Yes, I mean that would that would be the thing that gets into the everyday. But then there are other issues that come up that that really need to be not only dis discussed but a policy on them developed at a at a higher level and then cascaded down. Um, and the time pressures on in organisations often as these things get squeezed out a bit. Is that really necessary for us to do that? You know that type of thing. Answer: Yes, because if something really goes wrong, that the organisation will will suffer. So prevention is very very important in in, in applied ethics. And actually, I think that links to our, our next question, which is also about mental health and well-being. Um, but somebody says um, they're sometimes seen as part of talent programmes as opposed to ethics, but. Do you, do, what do you, which do you think is the recommended approach? Should ethics teams be con contributing to the wellbeing agenda, even in places where talent leads it? And I think our answer is yes. Well, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's always, it is. Um, the, the, the ethics teams in organisations um, do differ. And the larger the organisation, um, obviously, the more skills you have there. But in mediums and smalls, it's much more difficult. And uh, that's why we offer a service in that type of area to get to, to them to be able to talk to us about. And so we can share what information we, we would have on that. But it has to be addressed. It can't be neglected. Uh, and that sort of links into what you always say, Simon, which is that ethics is that part of everybody's business. It's not just one function. Ab absolutely. It's everybody's responsible for the, the ethical 
not only the ethical standards, but the application of those standards in the relationships uh, that are there in the workplace. And they're not just in with other, other employees, it's with your suppliers, uh, your customers, the people who supply you with finance, and, and the shareholders at work. Everybody's in, involved in this. It isn't to be left to an expert. That the, the thing will go wrong if that happens, just as it happens in health and safety. So, what are you advocating then for if there, if you do have an ethics and compliance function that you um, form good good relationships with other functions within the business so you can advise? Absolutely, them? absolutely. Internal audit and, and HR, you've, you've got to have it. Uh, HR has a lot of good information that you need. So, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Now, are there any other questions for um, Simon and Lynn? Let's see. Um, here's an interesting one that we haven't actually um, touched upon in, in our webinar today, but it's about um, human rights. So do you think that human rights issues are well embedded into ethics and compliance teams in the business? Um, well, I think they are to a certain extent. I mean, a lot of ethic pro ethics programs, for example, have a human rights policy. Um, and they also have uh, sort of a modern slavery policy, for example, and we have a modern slavery a briefing coming out later th this year. Um, um, so, yeah, there are things that different organizations are doing to focus on human rights, um, but always there could be more done. Um, so, yeah, there are some pro there is some progress, but um, still there, there are some lengths to go. Mm. Uh, let me see. Sorry. Scrolling down. Do you have any training recommendations for individuals new to the ethics world? Um, and this is a wonderful segue because actually we do. We have a um, we have a regular understanding business ethics training course which we hold here at the IBE. I think the next one is on the third of May, and. Um, and it's a day long course and it covers, um, uh, it, it's a great overview of understanding business ethics. So it covers um, the, the, the legal history, it covers, um, it touches on codes of ethics. And then we also have um, workshops, which we run regularly on specific aspects of an ethics program. So do head over to the IBE website and have a look at the, the training that we offer here. And uh, we also consider these webinars as kind of great CPD for um, any of your teams that you'd like to keep up to date. It, up to date. Uh, we've got this live webinar now, but um, afterwards it will be made available on our YouTube channel. So um, do um, feel free to share that with any members of your team. And yes, we do have global coverage um, and answer that question. Um, obviously, we're based in the UK, um, but um, for example, our Ethics at Work survey um, features 12 countries, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we're working, we're always working hard to, um, to spread the business ethics message um, all around the world. Um, do you have anything further to add about that, about our global coverage, Simon, do you think? No, what we're, we're, we, what we're aiming to do is to find uh, organisations similar to ourselves in other countries and link up with them rather than trying to do it ourselves. And we've made quite a lot of progress recently in this, in this area and we'll continue to do so. Uh, but uh, business ethics isn't just local, yeah. it's, it's international and, uh, uh, and there are some pretty wild um, problems out there uh, you have to be very careful who you deal with. So I think that's um, all the questions we have um, today. Unless you've got a quick one you'd like to pop in the question box. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to Simon and to Lynn for um, sharing with us um, the findings from the IBE Research Hub. Um, the, um, if you haven't had a chance to look at the handouts, um, in on this webinar. You can also find them on the IBE's website together with Lynn's blog about millennials which is going live today. Um, if you have any suggestions for future IBE webinars that you'd like us to do, um, please do get in touch and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.